everyone and welcome back to my channel. I'm Georgina and this is Art History Girl. Today we're continuing our series on women artists and we're looking at Marie Antoinette's own portraitist, Elisabeth Vigée Leprun. I love saying her name, Vigée Leprun. And I'm just going to do the first part of her life and then there'll probably be a part two at some point. There's just too much to include and she had a really interesting life. Now before we go any further, please remember to subscribe. You'll get lots more videos like this one if you do. Vigée Le Prince was clearly talented from a young age. Her father, Louis Vigée, was a minor artist who worked with pastels and allowed Elisabeth to mess around with his crayons. According to her memoirs, he told her, you will be a painter child if ever there was one. And this would have been around when she was 11 or 12, so she was undoubtedly promising when she was a child. During the 18th century, the middle classes were rapidly growing as overseas trade expanded, and they were a group of people who wanted to flaunt their newfound wealth and having their portrait painted seemed like the perfect solution. Vigée Le Prince painted her mother and her brother while she was still a teenager. Some sources say that she was as young as 14 when she finished these two paintings. Her mother's dressed as a sultana and her brother's meant to be a draftsman or a student. And they're extremely good. She got lots of commissions off the back of them. And it would seem that Vigée Le Prince did meet a few artists such as Doyenne and Vernet, who were friends of her father but she had no formal training to speak of, so she was essentially self-employed. In her memoirs, she says she became a very attractive young woman, which we can see from her self-portraits, and that she had a bit of an issue with the men she was painting because they kept being inappropriate towards her. She says, as soon as I observed any intention on their part of making sheep's eyes at me, I would paint them looking in another direction than mine. And then at the least movement of the pupils would say, I'm doing the eyes now. This vexed them a little, of course, but my mother, who was always present and whom I'd taken into my confidence, was secretly amused. And this was a really clever way of dealing with creepy, important and very powerful men. But some critics say that she actually invented the tradition of neoclassical men gazing heroically into the distance. But it wasn't an easy childhood in many ways for Vigée Le Prince. She'd been sent to a convent boarding school when she was just six years old and returned home when she was 11. After just one happy year of being at home, her father died and her mother remarried and became the wife of the jeweller, Monsieur Le Sevre. And here his stepdaughter has painted him reading in a satin robe and nightcap, which would have been our version of pyjamas. She's actually painted him quite sympathetically because the truth was both Vigée Le Prince and her brother hated their new stepfather. He was bad tempered and he also took a lot of the money that she earned from painting. She was banned from painting. Vigée Le Prince was 19 when officials sealed up her studio because she was painting professionally without having a license. And that was back then when you needed to be part of a guild to practice. So she applied and she was admitted to the Academy de Saint-Luc, the guild of painters and sculptors in Paris, which her father had been a part of. In her first exhibition there, she painted three allegories of the arts painting, poetry, and music. And this one is poetry, who's shown as a nude woman writing in a portfolio with a goose quill. And she looks upwards as though she's conveying a moment of inspiration. And this was probably part of the creepy men pose that she'd adopted and incorporated into her work. She became Marie Antoinette's artist. Vigée Le Prince was in her early 20s when she was first asked to paint a portrait of the Queen and she went on to paint more than 30 images of Marie Antoinette. It all started because the Queen had complained to her mother, Maria Theresa of the House of Habsburg, that she had been unable to find a portraitist who captured her likeness. She decided to try Madame Vigée Le Prince, probably because she had a solid reputation and had already painted a dozen portraits for aristocrats. In her memoirs, Vigée Le Prince says she was out walking in one of the royal parks when she met Marie Antoinette with several of her ladies-in-waiting. She was with her mother when the Queen stopped them and asked to walk with them, saying they could walk in any direction they liked. She says, they were all in white dresses and so young and pretty that for a moment I thought I was in a dream. And this is the first painting Vigée Le Prince ever completed of the young Queen. This is the biggest canvas she'd have worked on until this point, and some critics think she misjudged the proportions. She's made the column on the left extremely big and the drapery on the right is seemingly pressing down on the Queen. She's probably made her head a bit too small. It was probably the size she was used to doing and then had to fill in the rest of the canvas with this oversized background. 
She said in her memoirs, Marie Antoinette was tall and admirably built, being somewhat stout, but not excessively so. Her arms were superb, her hands small and perfectly formed, and her feet charming. Marie Antoinette was also a Habsburg, which was one of the most powerful royal families within Europe. And because they'd married cousins and inbred to keep the money within the family, they were also known for their pronounced jaws and thick lips from inbreeding. Vigée Le Prince paints the Queen looking most like her Habsburg relatives here, but as she continued to paint, you can see that she flatters her more and more and softens her features. Vigée Le Prince was really impressed by the Queen's complexion. She wrote, I could not render it as effect as I wished. I lacked colours to paint the freshness and fine tints that belonged to her charming face and hers alone. And there's a formality to this first portrait, which also softens over time. The Queen is in a stiff, formal pose, and it's a white satin dress she's wearing with large panniers. And those were hoops which were used to extend a woman's dress. On receiving the picture, the Queen's mother, Maria Theresa of Austria, wrote to her daughter saying, Your large portrait delights me. So at least someone was happy. Vichy Le Prince was inspired by Rubens. She went to Flanders with her husband on a business trip. And having been to Amsterdam, Vigée Le Prince created her own self-portrait based on one of the great European masters. Her pose here is deliberately modelled on Rubens' portrait of Susanna London, which used to be known as Le Chapeau de Paix, the straw hat, although it's thought that this was incorrect due to a mistranslation. The thing Vigée Le Prince really liked about this painting was the way that the hat cast a shadow over the sitter's face. She wrote, Great effect resides in the two different kinds of illumination, which simple daylight and the light of the sun create. And it would seem that she wasn't the only one who wanted to depict herself like this. We see the hat with shadow trend on the Duchess du Polignac and even Madame du Barry. Vigée Le Brun has even used the same hat in some of the pictures, covered in flowers with an ostrich feather coming off it. Unlike Susanna, who looks coyly towards the viewer, Vigée Le Brun has painted herself as a confident and attractive artist. She's holding her brushes and palette in one hand, and with an outstretched palm in the other hand as a gesture of friendship. And she's looking at the viewer with a direct gaze and a slightly open mouth, as though she's about to speak. This self-portrait was vital to Vigée Le Brun's popularity, because her wealth and beauty were part of her appeal. She's shown herself as a finely dressed lady in rich, expensive clothes and that makes her both the sitter and the artist. She's decorated herself like a true lady, so Vigée Le Prince is promising to make you look both fabulous, but you also enjoy her company because she's part of the upper class elite. And by referencing Rubens, it shows her as a painter who's well established because she's referencing this old master. And she's also one-upped him because she's actually wearing a straw hat and not one made out of beaver pelt. Vigée Le Prince was ambitious and she wanted to be remembered as one of the greats. In her eyes, the best way to do this would be to gain access to the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture, but because she was a woman, her profession was considered the same as her husband's. Monsieur Le Prince was an art dealer and the Academy rejected anyone with a commercial background, so it didn't seem like an option for Elizabeth. She wasn't having any of it though, so she asked the Queen to help her gain entry to the Academy by asking the King Louis XVI, her husband, to intervene. This undoubtedly would have annoyed plenty of people at the Academy, and Vigée Le Prince even admitted herself that she was unhappy that she had to ask to get in through royal favour. In her memoirs, she says she was probably excluded because of the misogyny and also the indifference of the Academy's director. Regardless, in May 1783, she became part of the institution and she was keen to make her mark. The highest form of painting at the time was history paintings, where a biblical or allegorical story was shown in one scene. Women were permanently disadvantaged because they weren't meant to draw or paint any nudes. Nonetheless, Vigée Le Prince flirted with creating a history painting. For her reception, she presented an image of peace bringing back abundance and it included female figures which towed the line of respectability because she'd have drawn them from nude and she hoped it would lead to the admission of the history painting category. The painting had been done two years before and it had been very successful at the time so the academy was still quite bitter from being forced to accept her and they purposely didn't enter the painting into any category. She painted Marie Antoinette in her underwear in 1783, Vigée Le Prince painted Marie Antoinette in a muslin dress or a chemise, which was a loose-fitting dress resembling the underwear that was worn at the time. 
This was how the Queen dressed at her palace in Versailles when she was relaxed and escaping the pressures of court with a couple of friends. When it was displayed at the salon, it caused instant uproar because the Queen's dress was considered inappropriate for a monarch and it was far too informal. While other European monarchs were being presented as maternal sovereigns and models of virtue, here was the Queen of France dressed as a shepherdess. While most people condemned the Queen for choosing the wrong dress, it could actually have been Vigée Lebrun's decision. She often modelled her sitters as she wanted them, often without their corsets, with their hair down, and sometimes even wearing her own dresses and ribbons. In her memoirs, she said, As I hated the clothes women wore at the time, I made every effort to render them more picturesque. Once I won the trust of my models, I was able to drape them according to my whim, to place light scarves around their bodies and arms. And she'd already painted a few aristocratic ladies in this gauzy chemise, including Madame du Barry and the Duchess de Polignac, one of Marie Antoinette's closest friends. These women were already controversial figures in France, but no one cared too much about how they dressed in their portraits because they weren't important enough. It was nothing compared to the uproar that Marie Antoinette experienced when her portrait was put on display. And the backlash was immediate. The salon visitors demanded that the portrait be removed from public view, but the damage was already done. One critic said, Vigée Le Brun unwittingly showed her as an immodest woman, providing enemies with yet more evidence against the Queen. The fabric itself was a major source of concern. Cotton was seen by the French as a very English fabric, since India was a British colony. Cotton chintz had risen in popularity in Britain and was a fashionable choice on that side of the channel by the 1780s. Therefore, it was seen as incredibly unpatriotic for the French queen to openly wear cotton. And with her loyalties already under question because she was of Austrian descent, her dress only confirmed her lack of Frenchness. And the queen's many critics were concerned that this choice would destroy the French silk industry. Vigée Le Brun had already prepared the exact same painting though, but with the Queen dressed more traditionally, so presumably she'd anticipated some sort of scandal, but it was probably more a fashion statement she was expecting than complete reputational damage. But two years after the dress was shown in this portrait, it became an incredibly popular piece of fashion in France and across Europe. Vigée Le Brun tried to help cover up a scandal. Now, there was another scandal which really was the nail in the coffin for Marie Antoinette, and it's called the Affair of the Diamond Necklace. A woman called Jean de la Motte became the mistress of the Cardinal de Rouen, who used to be the French ambassador in Vienna. The Cardinal was hated by Marie Antoinette because he had spread rumours about the Queen's behaviour to her mother, and he'd also been pretty rude about the Queen's mother behind her back as well. But he was trying to get back into Marie Antoinette's good books, because he wanted to become the French Prime Minister. Anyway, his mistress, Jeanne, had pretty much been boasting to everyone that she was really good friends with the Queen, even though they'd probably never met. After hearing this, the Cardinal asked Jeanne to put in a good word for him. And this exchanging of letters started between the Cardinal and someone he thought was the Queen, although it was actually his mistress, Jeanne, pretending to be the Queen. And after some time, he believed he was actually in love with Marie Antoinette. So he decided to meet her in a garden in Versailles, and he met up with a woman who he believed was Marie Antoinette, but it was actually just a prostitute who Jean had hired to pretend to be the queen. So in the letters, Jean told the cardinal that Marie Antoinette wanted to buy a diamond necklace, but she didn't want to buy such an expensive item publicly because it wouldn't reflect well on her while the French people were living in such poverty. So the pretend queen wanted the cardinal to act as a secret buyer on her behalf and Rouen negotiated the sale of the necklace for two million livres. Rouen then took the necklace to Jean's house where a man who Rouen thought was a valley of the queen came to pick it up. And then the diamond necklace was picked apart and the gems were sold on the black markets in Paris and London by Madame de la Motte. Both Jean and the Cardinal were arrested in 1785, but the public couldn't quite believe that the Queen wasn't involved in some way, and it really damaged her reputation. In an attempt to patch over her increasing unpopularity and the chemise painting incident, Marie Antoinette commissioned a painting of herself to look like the perfect mother. 
and it's thought Vigée Le Brun asked the neoclassical painter David for help with this one. And he recommended that she paint it in a pyramid shape to make it look particularly intimate and as though it was inspired by the old masters. She placed the children in the foreground to make it look like they were the Queen's most precious possessions. And with the empty crib next to them, it showed child loss and was probably meant to elicit an emotional response from the public. Unfortunately, it was too late for the Queen and the public really disliked her by this point. There were lots of images of her looking like a beast in the media and lots of very cruel cartoons. They thought she looked too sad in this painting and the crown jewels behind her were a horrible echo of the diamond necklace saga. Unfortunately, Vigée Le Brun was considered too close to the monarchy herself and she was also at risk from being taken out by the revolution, particularly as she had so many aristocratic friends. There were mutterings about having hidden affairs, I suppose because she was a very independent woman, and she was also thought to be very extravagant with rumours of her burning banknotes for heating. So fearing for her life, Vigée Le Brun left France with her nine-year-old daughter Julie and their governess in October 1789. And she abandoned her husband and life as she had known it, and they set off for Rome. So that is the end of part one of Vigée Le Brun. I hope you enjoyed it. It's such an interesting story, isn't it? She was very popular and likeable and just really adapted her talents so well to the world around her, a real businesswoman of her time. So if you'd like part two, please comment down below. Thanks very much for watching and thank you so much for all your comments. They're so kind and I really do appreciate them. So thank you. I'll try and keep up this channel in the next few weeks and months. Please remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you soon. Goodbye.